Quick numbers of San Francisco. We have a huge, great city of diversity and all different things. Um, lots of different numbers there. I won't go through them all, but just give you some ideas. We're very small, uh, but we're very connected. We have 24 million annual visitors, so a lot of people from overseas every day. Um, 400,000 registered vehicles, which is pretty low for a US city. Uh, and over a million transit trips a day. 88% of our households, new households, don't come with a car. They don't want one. So it's a big cultural shift that's happening. And nearly a quarter of all of our trips are walking. We're a walking city. And for most European cities, that's normal, but for a US city, that's, that's extraordinary. And so what's happening in San Francisco, which is happening all over the world, is we're seeing big trends that are shaping our whole way of life. Whether it's people who are retiring out, grandparents are still hanging around going out to nightclubs now, right? 25 years ago, grandparents were on a walking stick like this. You know, the world is changing, we're staying more active. Millennials and Generation X, basically anybody under 45, <laughs> is completely living life differently to how their parents were. These are changing how people are using cars. Our driver's licenses are dropping in California for the first time in 20 years. Um, and it's also reducing the funding that we rely on to move our transportation system. Now, on the technology side, things are changing really fast as well. Ubiquitous connectivity is global. People are connecting to services worldwide. What that means is that there's no more workplace anymore. The cafe with Wi-Fi is the new jobs place. As long as you get a connection at a cafe, you can have a job. The problem with that though is that you're working everywhere, anywhere, but you're always working all the time. And that means that you're never switched off. This thing is constantly bugging us, right? And part of us don't want it, but we're also glad we got that text because we kind of like that, you know. So it means that we never have to be alone with our thoughts anymore. We're always with this phone. So these are changing. For mobility, what's interesting is that it's changing the way people choose to travel. Much to the surprise to many people, the car keys have been replaced by this. This is more important now for, the, for many people in, in city centers because staying connected with your friends, family, and work from point A to point B is almost as important as getting there on time because you can tell them that you're five minutes late because now you're never late because it's always on. So, People who have to drive are missing out. They can't stay connected because they're driving their car and they don't want to do that anymore. So, but the choices aren't there for everybody to do that yet. So this is my parents' generation. Everything revolves around the car. The car on Friday night, the car on Saturday night, hang out with your friends, go for a drive. This was the social way of connecting. Not my generation, this is how we connect. We do this all the time. Right? So we're not really paying attention anymore to anything. Now if we all do this, including the train driver, we end up like this. No one is paying attention to anything because we're so focused on our phone. So hopefully we're not going to get to that point, but this is the sort of things that are, that are affecting our trends and making us think, wait a second, something's happening here, we need to think about this more. And how we get, you know, advertised is really important to how we think about ourselves and our culture. This is actually what we call a manufactured love affair with the automobile. It didn't exist before. We made this up. Uh, we believed the BS from the car companies. Sorry, the car companies in the room. And this is what we believed. If we buy this car, we get to drive on this beautiful road. We're the sexy person in the car. We get a boyfriend or a girlfriend or both, depending on what you want. And we get to be famous for, five, for, for getting this car. And when you buy it, this is what you get. That's what you get when you buy the car. This is false advertising, people. This is the wrong way to do this. And, you know, we're the capital of self-driving cars. We have 13 car companies testing self-driving cars in our city. And if everybody gets a self-driving car, and it's, all, and it's electric as well, this is what happens to our freeway system. I'll change the slide. I just changed the slide. <laughs> so this is not our future that we want. You know, and we're the capital of innovation, but we need to think about this in a holistic way as well. <laughs> and then this is the problem that we have. Every federal government around the world has what we call a binary policy system. The policy and the funding and the money goes towards cars, 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 through parking, through roads, through streets, through uh, uh, building systems. And sometimes the government feels guilty and they give some money for public transport. You know, that's really what we have around the world. 
And this system doesn't work for cities anymore. It's just not compatible. Because guess what? A car is 80% empty. Think of your car. Who owns a car in this in this uh, who, who owns a car? I don't own a car, but who owns a car? Like, who doesn't own a car? Come on, don't be ashamed. Okay. Well done, people. Okay. <laughs> if I gave you a business deal and said, you're gonna buy something that is 80% empty, in other words, 80% unused, 95% of the time it stands still, it doesn't move, and you have to pay for it up front, the whole thing. You're like, you're mad. Well, that's what you do with your car. It's the biggest sales pitch of the century and you all bought it, right? <laughs> so really dumb, right? Really dumb use of infrastructure. Now, our public transit cousins, who are our public transit poor cousins, also have to buy these buses and trains. And in the middle of the morning and in the middle of the evening, they're so full, people can't get on, but the rest of the day, they're half empty or more than half empty. Again, not a good use of our, of our resources. So we look at these two things as these binary areas, and anybody understand what an accordion is? You have these two ends of the accordion, and shared mobility is everything in between. It's all the new things that have popped up because the car and the bus and the train don't meet everybody's needs, and they don't have to. We keep focusing so much that everybody should do one or the other, but there's a whole different mix in between. It's not just Coca-Cola or Diet Coke, it's orange juice, it's apple juice, it's all these different things in between, right? So it's different flavors for different people. Whether it's car sharing or bike sharing, taxi sharing, whether it's van shuttles, we have electric scooter sharing in San Francisco, something that Athens could do tomorrow because they love their scooters here. Um, we have all these different services. We even have Uber for children to take the school kids around because the parents are too busy doing all this stuff or they're probably on this, right? So, there's all these different services that are popping up to meet all the different needs of, of, of people. And MTA, our agency, has really understood that and said, we understand this now and we place people at the very top of what we call our mobility wheel and all the other things are just mechanisms to get you from A to B. Fundamentally, we are all pedestrians. We'll begin our trip and we end our trip as pedestrians and everything around us is a tool. It also means that bicycling is not better than transit. Transit is not better than driving. And taxes are not better than, 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 uh, than walking. They're all tools to be used in an ecosystem and they all have their place. And those of you who are avid cyclists against transit or transit against driving, you're wasting your energy. You should all band together and go after the car. That's your job. So I hope you understand that. Um, also in government, you know, we have an amazing way of saying, well, this is how it's always been done. Who's heard that in their office in the last 20 years? Well, this is how it is. This is how we do it. Exactly, right? No, stop that. Move on and say, let's try something different. You know, we need to move on. And we did this, you know, in San Francisco, we had a double-decker freeway in the middle of the city along the waterfront. The entire waterfront was dilapidated. No one went there. It was really ugly. Um, this is the third turn on the right that was almost empty. Mother Nature gave us an urban planning present and caused an earthquake and knocked the whole thing down. And we debated whether we should rebuild it and we said we can't afford to rebuild it. So we created a promenade esplanade instead. You know, something that was very common in Europe that was a, a great best practice for us. Now this is one of the most thriving uh, corridors in the city and we close it once a month um, and open it to people and people get to walk and bicycle and play games and dance and, and, and have fun. And people tell us that they love this. They hate traffic. They hate parking. But they love this because they can hear birds and they can hear people walking and dancing. They can hear high heels. They can hear all these different things. And it's really exciting for them because when we show them a plan or an architectural drawing, they don't understand this. But we show them a video of last Sunday, they're like, oh yeah, I love that. I want more of that. And we say, but that means we have to take out your street for like a couple of days. Like, let's just try it out, see how it goes. So testing and playing with streets is really important. Now we have all the policies. California is one of the most advanced uh, economies and one of the most rigorous climate change uh, advocates in the world. And many of that policy have been replicated all over the world from our global warming bill in 2006, to our sustainability strategies, what you call SUMPs. Um, we also have one specifically for San Francisco. And so we're very aligned with all of our state and uh, uh, regional and local goals. We have our state highway network, our regional network, and our city networks, and they all work very well together. 
Now the thing is we need to actually act on certain things on the street. That's where it gets really fun. And so we ask ourselves, we ask our citizens and our residents, how should we grow? We're going to grow anyway, so how should we grow? And we point and say we should grow in these areas, and this represents the number of jobs we're going to allow to grow in this area, the number of housing, so we can have a balanced system that meets our transportation needs. And we also set a vision forward of saying, we are going to have a transportation system that provides excellent choices. Not just that bikes are better than walking, or walking is better than transit, but that the whole thing works better for everybody. And to do that, we as a transport agency have to align ourselves with better land use. So we as a transport agency advocate on behalf of the city for stronger land use. Imagine a transit agency telling a planning department how it should do its planning. Wouldn't that be a fun conversation to be at? I've been there, really fun. Um, and the reason we do that is because we want to let them know that every action they take to allow one more car parking spot or one more separated use affects the transport system negatively. Every time they reduce parking and they increase density, it helps the transport system. So we're very clear about what we stand for. And we've actually gone a little further and worked with developers now and say, if you work with us, we'll walk you through the city planning process. We'll actually guide you through it as, as a client. And we will go to the public commission meeting and say, the MTA approves of this project because it actually meets our transportation needs. So we developed a strategic plan because we never had a business plan before. Many translators have no business plan. They don't know where they're at. They don't know where they want to go. And they don't know how to get there. So I was brought in and basically put together a strategic plan and said, in the next six years, we're going to go from 62% auto trips to 50% auto trips. And we're going to do it in six years. Every year we're going to do a whole bunch of different things. We're going to create walkable streets and spaces. We're going to improve our local and regional transit network, which was a shambles at that time. We're going to improve our bicycle network facilities, which was fully fragmented and, and terrible to ride on. And we're going to incorporate these new partners called vehicle sharing and, and shuttles. And we set a goal and said, let's see how we get there. We knew from the very beginning we needed a very strong strategy. And our strategy was focused on demand management, managing the demand, and then managing the supply. You have to manage both, not just one or the other. And the federal government was giving us money for supply, but no money for demand. And so saying this is wrong, so we decided to change it. So smart land use, demand pricing for parking, better choices, capital choice for the public, and then fixing public transit cheaply and quickly, not, not worrying about the 20-year metro project, but how do we fix the buses tomorrow, you know? How do we fix the bike network tomorrow, and how do we bring in vehicle sharing uh, quickly? And so we work with developers to figure out how do we actually leverage all this growth in our city? All this growth is happening and the transport system wasn't getting any money for it. So we came, came in and said, listen, your projects are going to impact the transport system and we have a culture of no. So we're going to say no, 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 and it's going to take you 10 years to go through the process. Some of you may go bankrupt. That's not a good thing to do. Let's work with you and actually say yes and, and do it together. So each of these projects represents about 5,000 new houses or 5,000 new jobs and each one of them has an agreement with us to pay their fair share of impact to the transport system. And we break it down to a formula for a, a dollars per square meter, which means that each of these developments will buy into trains, buses, train depots, bike lanes, bus lanes, they'll pay for bike sharing. But most importantly, all of these developments require all new residents to be given a mobility pass. And that mobility pass allows them $100, up to $100 a month to use any transport service in the city. And it's part of their fee for their apartment. They can't take it away. And they can't vote to get rid of it. It's actually fixed in as a policy. There was three sentences for, of us for policy. And we completely changed the way our financing is with, with development. So you don't need money to make money. You just need some good sentences somewhere and make it stick. And it's really important. Also, we started on parking management. You know, parking was a disaster in San Francisco. 30% uh, of all of our traffic congestion was people looking for a parking spot. Imagine that, slowing down our transit system, causing collisions with cyclists, hitting people crossing the sidewalk. And we developed a new way of looking at parking, saying, let's get people to their parking spot as quickly as possible, but let's make sure that we manage demand. If the 
area is over demand for parking, the prices slowly go up. If the area doesn't have high demand for parking, the prices slowly go down so we can reach equilibrium. So that people can basically say that where it's red on the app is where it's going to cost you a lot of money to park. Where it's blue, it's going to cost you the least. It's sometimes two blocks away. But that information now means that you're not circling looking for that spot, you know exactly where to go. And what it also does is it allows people to actually get to the stop very quickly. And we also allow our parking control to see exactly where every spot is and who has paid and who hasn't paid. So now the parking meter is not roving around. They go to spot 97 straight away and give the ticket, which is you know not good for customers, but good for the budget. So we've looked at these different ways to do this to say, how do we make this actually work more effectively? And it actually has helped us a lot. It's reduced vehicle miles traveled, or vehicles kilometers traveled, and greenhouse gas emissions by 30%, just by changing the way that we manage parking. Again, not a high cost thing, but utilizing technology to help us make a better system for everybody. People use this as a dating app for when they're dating as well. So you get a notification if your parking is up, if the date's not going well, you say, oh, I've got to clean my parking, so I've got to go. But if the date's really well, you just top it up for an extra two hours and you stay. And we're waiting for the first SF Park wedding, so you might be able uh, to see that. Um, but these are the things you can do and then play with the system. Also, how we manage our streets. You know, when we're looking at our complete streets projects, we started noticing something very odd. The people who use the most space are in the least amount of, of need. So look at this tram, 65 people in the tram, 55 people in the bus, 21 people in this small cluster of bicycles, and this long line, what looks like congestion, is one person in each car for two blocks. And guess, it, guess which one the politicians focus on? That one person in that car, because that's congestion, that's bad, right? And we say, wait a second, why are they more important than the 21 people on bicycles or the 110 people in the bus? If everybody's equal, the bus needs its own lane and the bikes need their own lane and whatever's left over, we can give to the cars. Imagine that as a concept. So really starting to ask the question, what do we use our space for and who's using our space? And that's what we did. We started transforming our streets saying, we don't need a lot of money to transform our streets. These extra areas where people are eating, having their coffees and drinking and stuff, that's actually a platform that we put over our parking spots on the street because the store owner wanted to have more people visit his store and he actually paid for it with a local artist. We created a local economy with this. Two spots in front of cafes creating more outdoor area to eat and, and enjoy and then he had to hire two more part-time people. So we were creating economic development by improving the environment and reducing our costs of our system. So these are things that you can see very quickly uh, that, can, that can change your walking strategy uh, quite cost effectively. We've also done pilots where we've actually closed off parts of our streets and just painted them so that we can create a quick plaza. We don't have a, the beautiful plazas that you do in Europe, so we try to make them as quickly as possible uh, with the help of people. This is our famous street on Powell Street where the cable cars run, and that whole street has a new parklet that's three blocks long and it was paid for by Audi, the car company. So there's good sometimes when you work with them. So they said, you know, we want to be sustainable. We want to help be part of San Francisco sustainability. You know, what can we do? We said, stop making cars. Um, but they said, we can't do that. So I said, okay, well then pay for this. So um, they paid for it, which was great. And it's Audi, it's all in that aluminium color that Audi is, and they have the four rings everywhere. And you know, it worked out very well. And you know, Using data is very important when we're talking about this because apart from making that very fun experience, we're trying to create the data to make the case of why we need to focus our resources, which are very limited. We have a lot of pedestrian collisions and fatalities in San Francisco, and I was on the Mayor's Task Force and we created Vision Zero for, for San Francisco, 